Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, Bilic is on the verge of being sacked by West Ham. David Moyes has been lined up to replace him until the end of the season. Antonio Conte claims he's worked miracles at Chelsea ahead of their clash with Manchester United at Stamford Bridge this afternoon. And the fans, they're getting restless at Swansea and West Brom. Paul Clement and Tony Pulis both feeling the heat after defeats in the Premier League yesterday. In the hot seat this morning, Jason Burt is the Chief Football Correspondent at the Daily Telegraph. Miguel Delaney is the Chief Football Writer at The Independent. And Dom King is the North West Football Reporter at The Mail. Morning to you guys, good to see you. As ever, don't forget you can tweet the show at Sunday Sup. The best will appear on your screen over the next 90 minutes. OK, let's have a look at some of the papers then. Billich is done for, according to The Sun. Their front page of their goal section lost 4-1 at home to Liverpool yesterday. He's on his way out, we think. David Moyes coming in to replace him. It's a heartbreaker at the Olympic Stadium. Message, though, for the under-17s from the England manager, Gareth Southgate. Don't get cocky. That's after they put their shirts... They turned their shirts round for the pictures last weekend after winning the under-17s World Cup. We're coming on to them in part four of today's programme. Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, good for him yesterday. Goals galore for Liverpool in the firing line, though, is Slaven Bilic and Mourinho. He says he's just one trophy away from greatness in the Sunday Times this morning. I'd say he's already there after winning the Champions League with Porto and Inter Milan. Uh, the people, the front page of their football section, Tony Pulis, he's on the brink. They lost at Huddersfield yesterday. The fans are going mad at the Hawthorns. Uh, will the fans be going mad at Stamford Bridge this afternoon? Conti, he said he had to work miracles when he inherited Jose Mourinho's side. He went on to win the title last season, of course. The miracle man, he's got a job waiting for him at the San Siro. If he wants it, according to the Express this morning, he's on his way to Milan if he loses his job at Chelsea. And more, the merrier. He was on his way to Paris Saint-Germain a couple of weeks ago. Well, according to Steve Bates this morning in the um, Sunday Mirror, Jose Mourinho is about to get a pay rise as the Manchester United manager. One man won't begin to pay rise, he'll begin to pay off, though. It's Slaven Bilic and Salah with the goal of the game yesterday at Olympic Stadium. He's finished off Slaven Bilic, we think, and that's where we're going to start this morning because this is a man who's been under pressure for weeks, Jason. Um, but the 4-1 defeat yesterday and the manner of it against Liverpool, does this really mean it's the end? He's been under pressure for more than a year, really. Even this yeah. time last year, it looked like he was almost going from a game-to-game -game basis, trying to save his job as a away match at Crystal Palace about this time last year, where he had to win that game to, to survive, basically. And it's been like that ever since, and that's unsustainable for any manager. And I think, unfortunately for him, this will be the, the final straw. I think there'll be a, a board meeting um, in the next 24 hours, probably, at which they'll make the final decision to, to part, part the ways with him. And, and I expect an announcement in the next 48 hours that he'll go and that David Moyes will, will come in probably till the end of the season. Mm -hmm. um, he's, only, he's in the last year of his contract anyway, so there won't be a huge amount of compensation. I think the, the kind of final straw, apart from obviously the, the run of results I've had recently, was at the end of the last transfer window. We had a statement from the chairman, David Sullivan, in which he sort of basically basically threw his manager under a bus. I mean, he said they hadn't signed Renato Sanchez mm -hmm. and Kokoviak. These are players that they could have signed. Not quite sure that is the case. William Carvalho from Sporting Lisbon was one that Bilic wanted. But to be fair to West Ham, they backed him in the transfer market this summer. Already. And Ortovic was his signing, Hernandez. So I think they were mitigating circumstances last season when they moved to the new stadium, when the squad wasn't good enough, when we had the whole Dimitri Payet stuff. Um, but this season, there are a lot fewer excuses, and I, and I, I think, unfortunately, I can understand why they, they're probably going to make a change. You think it has run its course for, for Bilic? I think, unfortunately, it probably has. I mean, I think he's not really getting the responses now, and I think losing, losing at home to Liverpool isn't the result that's going to kill him. The result that's killing him is, is losing a 2-0 lead to Crystal Palace, not beating Burnley away when they're, when they're winning there, and then really losing 3-0 at home to Brighton. They probably looked at all three of those games as possibly nine points they could have had. They got two. Um, it's not losing to Liverpool, although obviously the manner of defeat was pretty crushing in the end. It's not that defeat that's going to do him, but obviously in the, in the circumstances under, he needed to get something yesterday. Yeah, and he didn't. They lost 4-1, of course, against Liverpool. Um, it, it does feel, always feel strange in these circumstances, Miguel, to be talking about manager who's still in a job as things stand. Yeah. But we, think, we also think we know his replacement. Um, is, that, is that modern football? Yeah, of is course. That, it's just that, is that the way it works? Or, hold on a minute. This, this is a dignified guy. This is a guy that's very, very popular. I think he's probably still popular with West Ham supporters, even if the results aren't good. But, hey, come on. We're talking about a guy who's still in the job here, and yet we know his replacement. But that's the game. And I, and, I mean, we always talk about clubs and their planning. And if they are serious about it, then <laughs> these contingency plans have to be made. I mean, talk of this has been going on for about a year. Um, and I suppose, as Jason said, this problem has, has been gone for so long as well that they, they can't but have made contingency plans. I mean, it's quite an odd one, Bilic, in that sense. It's exactly 10 years since his Croatia team 
or almost exactly 10 years since they knocked England out of the World of Euro 2008 qualifiers. Mm -hmm. Look like they're going to be the kind of the force in international football for the next few years, and yet two years after that, England were thrashing them five-one. And it seems quite an odd trend in his career in that sense that he just goes from quite a unit that responds to him to then suddenly these sides where, like, like yesterday against Liverpool, gaps appear all over the place. They just seem to lose that focus. Um, I remember, I mean, I've heard separately from two people at two uh, top six clubs that they found West Ham the easiest team to play tactically in the league last season. Um, and I suppose all of this is manifesting now. So with all that in mind, you know, West Ham can't but make mm -hmm. plans. But a few bad results and that's it. You, he's, got, he's got no time here, has he? Because he's had two mid-table finishes well, since he's been the West Ham manager. But this time it's, well, look, a few bad results. Jason mentioned the Palace game when they were 2-0 up yesterday and the manner of the performance and the manner of the submission, really. Uh, but, but, but that is it. It felt like it was in this unsustainable situation of going from two game blocks to two game blocks. And you can't work like that. I mean, you can't build like that. Mm. Can he save himself? I don't in talks know. with David Sullivan, can he say, Look, hold on, give me one more, one more chance? No, I think, it's, uh, I think it's unsustainable. That's the right word Mikel used. It's, uh, I mean, we had this situation at the start of the season where they lost three games and already he was, he was under pressure and Billich's representatives had to meet David Sullivan when he was in Marbella and, you know, he was given sort of a bit of time. Then that statement came out. Uh, and then there was more, wasn't there, on the Friday Night Football when um, Sullivan spoke to Gary Neville. You just look at the, you looked at it last night, uh, the camera angles around the ground and you could see like dots of empty seats and the, um, you, could, you could detect the mood that's flat and his, his body language, the way he is, you know, and he's, he's a, a very emotional guy, isn't he? he? He wears his heart on his sleeve almost. And um, he, looks, he looks like he, he just doesn't know what to do with it anymore. Mm. But West Ham think they know what they're going to yeah. do, which so, is to bring in David Moyes. David Moyes, yeah. So um, if they if they do that, what will he offer? He's had a rough ride in his last few jobs. He has, and a lot of people look at David Moyes now and think that he is maybe yesterday's man. They've got man the Manchester United experience in his mind in in their minds. They've got uh, what happened last year at Sunderland, and they will be anticipating and Sausage that in between, and, yeah. in between. <clears throat> um, and they will be anticipating more of the same. But I think Moyes, this time, he knows that he is on. The, this is his last chance, basically, to, to prove himself. One more, one more failure. That's, that that will be that will be him, and he knows that. And when he he's, he's I know from working with him at Everton, what he's like when he's when he feels that he's got a pr point to prove. Very, very dangerous man. Well, dangerous in terms of he, he will, he will get a job done. And I think if, if he comes in, he will organise West Ham. He'll keep them up, no problem he, at all. He's a manager they've admired for quite a long time. I think when when Sam Allardyce was 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 going, they wanted Moyes. Then at that stage, I think he's got a good relationship with Tony Henry, the sort of director of football at West Ham. They worked together at, at Everton, so they've obviously tracked him for a long, long time. And imagine what they're probably thinking is, okay, he's had two or three failures, but actually we, we want the David Moyes from Everton back. That's what we want, and we want to throw him this lifeline to see if he can. Throw us a lifeline, yeah. really. I think I think there's a huge risk involved. Personally, mm -hmm. I think once you've had a trajectory of a career where you've had two or three failures, everyone can have a failure, but two or three in a row, that starts to be a trend. And I think he really is going to be fortunate to get this job, and I think he needs to respond quickly. What what I worry about is Dom saying get them organised, but I always think he's a bit of a slow burner of yeah. a manager. He doesn't go in there and get that sort of quick response from from clubs, and I think they, that's what they need at Everton. But yeah, OK, he'll get them more defensively organised. I just wonder whether or not there's quite a high risk involved in the fact that he's available is almost kind of superseding the fact that maybe he's the right man for the job. It's quite yeah. ironic, actually, in that sense, because right now they could probably do it, or given all their plans of expansion, they could actually probably do it in Allardyce. Someone that comes in and has proven uh, putting a structure on a team in a short, in a short space of time mm. and just to stabilise. And so with, with, with Moyes, what his, his characteristic at Everton was always these teams were hard to beat, they were well-structured, which we haven't seen in his last three jobs. Yeah. So I think I, th I think it's it's unfair. Basically, he's got this label of being defensive, but there was a spell at Everton from around about 2006 onwards where he built this really young team with Baines, Jagielka, Pienaar, Kale, Arteta. He wants to play good football. I don't think that he's coming into like that's a, that's a decade ago that you're talking about, though. Yeah, it is a decade ago, but I mean, his, his views on how he wants to play football doesn't, doesn't change. Sure. I mean, he wants to get his. I mean, as I said, he'll get them organised first and foremost. But if he gets the players to play, you know playing how he wants, he can play. The team play great football. Mm. So that Everton, Everton team that I, I talked about was really good. Should've... So what, what the Sunderland experience? What happens there? We just 
we just write it off, he just writes it off and says, you know what, it's one of those things that happens. Never had a chance. Did he stand a chance there? Was that no, his fault? Does he take any... Does, does he need to take he, some responsibility he, he suffered, for that? He suffered at Sunderland because he was, he was... He's got... He's a very honest man when he speaks. And I think... I think we're in a game where we know... When he said they're in relegation yeah, yeah, back yeah, right he said, he said that yeah, right away. Down, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he, 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 he says things as he sees them. You know, we're in a game where people, you know, can sort of manipulate messages and whatever. He'll just tell you how it is. And people don't, don't sort of like it mm. sometimes. But um, I, I don't think anybody could succeed with Sunderland with the way, the way they are. I mean, the squad that he inherited was, was, was poor. The OK, when he takes the West Ham job, does he inherit the job and say, OK, we'll win a relegation battle? I don't think so, same? no. I don't think so, no, because he... Uh, I they, think he does off. say that. I think yeah. that's exactly what they are in. I think the West Ham fans are expecting to say West, that. I don't think West Ham are in a relegation battle. I, I think I, they I, are. I think that's probably why they're turning to David Moyes. I, 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 think I, mean, I, think I think they've had a, a bad start, but I think, I think if you get to them, they'll be, they'll be comfortable mid-table. They should be comfortable mid-table, mm. but I think they are in a relegation battle. I mean, if you look, they've got, they've got two or three games coming up which are probably, probably winnable, and then they've mm. got sort of Chelsea... Man City, Arsenal, yeah. I mean, they've got a terrible run before it. Christmas. If he can't put in a structure straight away and they lose those games and suddenly it's Christmas and they're, and they're right in it, I mm. might be fearful for them, I have to say. Mm. I think, I think any, I mean, uh, that's, why, that's why all this is happening at the moment, because you've got a number of clubs in, that, in, the, in the table who, who are just panicking all the time about going down. I think we had all this money coming into the Premier League and, you know, obviously it made everyone be more ambitious, but actually at the same time, are we fearful of getting relegated? So you see, that's why we're seeing so many of these stories now, more and more stories about managers being under pressure. You know, the manager said to me earlier this season, you got, you're four games away from a crisis, basically. Mm. That's it. You're four games away from a crisis. Where whoever you are, four, three or four bad results and you're in a crisis. That is just the modern management now. And that's why all these clubs are having these situations where two or three bad results and suddenly it's like, is Tony Pulis going to go? Is can, Pellegrino going to go? Can I say back to a, a starting point in, in our careers, was there ever a point <laughs> when a manager wasn't in a crisis? You know, if you think, OK... I think we, it comes more quickly now. Of, I think it comes... the 70s or... Yeah. The, the Everton side in the 80s, Manchester United in the, in the early 90s. But if they lost the game, that back then was the manager in crisis. I think, I think what happens now is it's, it's all clubs. I think before it was a few clubs that actually if they weren't achieving what they wanted to achieve, then they would be quickly into a crisis. Now it's all clubs, basically. If you get three or four bad results, every manager has been looked at and there's no real... Whatever you've achieved in the past is kind of like quickly forgotten because people are looking at it and thinking, and it's part, it's part, of, the, it's part of the 24-7 news cycle. That's what it partly is. But it's also because the ambition that the clubs have, because they all look at it and think, you know, in some ways it's Claudio Ranieri's fault as well <laughs> because he won the league with Leicester. And everyone's looking at it and thinking, well, he won the league with Leicester. We can get up that table. We, why aren't we the one? You know, mm. you've got Alice Short the other day sort of saying, we, we, we should be finishing seventh in the Premier League. What basis can Sunderland owners say we should be finishing seventh in the Premier League? I mean, uh, uh, but everyone, every, every club outside the top six is looking at it and thinking, well, we should be the one pushing up that, uh, against that glass ceiling. We should be pushing ahead and trying to get into the top five or six clubs. On what basis do they think that? I'm not quite sure, but they've got a bit of money and they've seen Leicester do it and they're all thinking... Yeah, we should be doing that. And by the same token, every club wants to appoint kind of the next Pochettino, that manager yeah. who's not quite at that level, not quite at a top level yet, but building. Yeah. Which is probably Marco Silva, maybe. Yeah, yeah, sure. And of course, he's been linked with a job this mm. week as well, which is Everton, uh, which we'll come on to a bit later. Um, well, I saw Liverpool as well because they, they were rampant yesterday. Do we? Um, and a much improved, or it was an impressive perfor performance um, from Jurgen Klopp. So, what's your assessment of, of their season so far? Because the, the sort of clopometer has moved from the needle. Yeah, we're back, we're back <laughs> over yeah, here does, now, yeah. It? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Everything's fine now, yeah. yeah. The, the, Every, everything the title is fine. Yeah. On. Yeah. Where, where is it? <laughs> Where's the clopometer for you? Um, it's, it, oh, yeah, well, it's, it's title challenge time now, yeah. So we're going from there to there. But they're so. sick in the table. Yeah, don't worry, I've got plenty <laughs> of time to go. Um, no, um, I think the difference yesterday, you've got Mane back and Salah and Firmino, and when he's got those three, um, they'll, they'll beat any of the teams below them. No problem, they're going to score lots of goals. They've had... <sighs> Do you know what they're like? They're a bit like, at the minute, um, they're like a bag of revels. You don't know what you're going to get. You're going to put your hand in, you don't know what you're going to get. And sometimes you're going to get the coffee one. And the coffee, <laughs> the coffee performance is Man, uh, is Man City away and Tottenham away. Mm. And until they, uh, until they find some, some consistency... I mean, you don't need me to sort of spell out what everybody knows. The defence isn't as, as good as it should be. They've got deficiencies in terms of you know. He just, he just that's that's fine with us to say that, but he disputes that, doesn't he? Oh the yeah, disputes that. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, um, he has 
tremendous faith in the players that are there, tremendous loyalty, um, tremendous faith in his own ability to make them improve. Um, and he doesn't he doesn't understand like the sort of knee-jerk way or how emotional the people can can get here in terms of talking about Liverpool in in terms of you know the mistakes that we've been seeing over three four years. He, he is adamant that he can he can make them improve. Mm. The interesting aspect yesterday I noticed at uh, the London Stadium was towards the towards the end the game the game's up for West Ham it's all over isn't it they haven't got a, they haven't got a chance but he's still coaching the players on the sidelines demanding the energy, the enthusiasm, mm. the vitality the expected in the first minute. And I, I just thought, if that was Mourinho, he'd perhaps game management would be saying, save yourselves, guys, we're four one up, we're in cruise control here. But Klopp's methods may be slightly different. Yeah, they are. And as we've, we, we've spoken about the de defensive issues, it was, it was the same last week against Huddersfield. Um, he, he wants that sort of maximum concentration because he knows the people will be waiting to, to pick up on the slightest sort of sort of failing in terms of the defence um, and he just wants that maximum concentration where he can get a, a sequence of games where they've only conceded a, you know, a handful of goals. Mm. Do the players love him? Is the affection there that was there that we saw at the very, very beginning of his oh, yeah, regime? I mean, yeah. And we're going back a couple of years ago yeah, now, but I mean, is, it, is it there? Is the affection there? Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a really popular manager. I've never, you never sort of hear people moaning about him or, you know, sort of... You know what it's like when, when, when people have access to ground, we, hit, we hear stories, but you never sort of hear anything coming their way from him. He's, mm. he's, he has this sort of um, thing with them where he, he's the friend, but he's not the, not the best friend. Well, even mm. in the Dortmund season, he, even, even when Dortmund had that collapse, they never actually, you never really heard the kind of say, the stories are coming out in Chelsea in 2015-16, mm. it, was, it was still kind of, well, we're on this together, we'll, we'll get out of it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Players do turn on managers from time to time. It happened with Chelsea and Jose Mourinho a couple of years ago. His replacement, Antonio Conte, says he performed a miracle winning the league title last season. That game this afternoon, Chelsea against Manchester United. More on that coming next. <laughs> Welcome back. We're going to talk Chelsea and Manchester United. It's not just Billich making the headlines this morning. It's Antonio Conte as well. Um, I had to work miracles in the mail on Sunday this morning. That's last season after he inherited um, his uh, Chelsea side from Jose um, Mourinho, um, and also a story in The Sun this morning saying that David Luiz um, is facing the chop uh, today along with Gary Cahill as well, both axed for the game against United according to Mike McGrath in The Sun this morning. Um, what, um, let's take, take you back to Rome, um, first of all, in the Champions League because you were there, McGraw, yeah. weren't, we, weren't you? Um, what do you think, when you, your reflections on, on the performance, what happened and Conte's mood afterwards? Um, his mood was stung. I think he's a manager that probably dislikes defeat more than anyone bar Josie Mourinho in terms of how much they affect him. But I thought it was quite a strange performance as well because weirdly even though Chelsea conceded two goals in the first half they weren't actually that bad then bar the obvious uh, Rudiger mistake but they were kind of in the game. Hazard had about four chances where he kind of shot straight at the keeper and had it gone a slightly different way could have been a different result but then in the second half they, they kind of just fell apart they were destroyed and I think uh, Conte has to carry some of the can of that because I think some of this was a consequence of what is evidently a case of him trying to kind of balance the team. Now that they've got European football, he doesn't necessarily have the full squad he wants, and he's trying to maintain the intensity that they had last season, or the cohesion they had last season, but the ch some of the changes he's, make he's making are actually making it worse. I mean, one of the inexplicable things about uh, Tuesday, which I thought kind of contributed maybe to the second goal, was the fact that Lee Cahill was switched from left to right, and so much, so much like, it, it is as if he's, in trying to solve these problems they have for more games, they're not necessarily solutions, but kind of adding to the problems. Um, I would have a certain sympathy for him given I think the squad maybe isn't fully suited. Um, but yeah, it, they're quite, but they're quite strange though with Chelsea. That game almost reflected it in that, you know, there's a lot, because it's Chelsea, there's a lot of perceptions, there's another crisis, the, the teams are far, falling apart or whatever. But yet, in the last month or two months, they've still had some excellent performance and they go very up and down right now. Mm. When, when um, Conte won the title last season, he used pretty much the same. We, we, could, we knew pretty much the 11 starters week in, week out. Did he squeeze the pips out of them to such an extent that they just haven't got anything left to give this season? I wouldn't go that far. Um, I know he's, he's had those quotes today about whether it was a miracle last season. Uh, I don't think it was a miracle, miracle because of the fact he didn't have European football. But I think it's underappreciated just how, difficult, how, how much of a basket case maybe that team was to come into given what happened the previous season. But I think one of the major differences was basically that 11 last season, everything fitted together so well. It was, it was 
you know, perfectly cohesive. Whereas this season, it's almost like a little, <coughs> little bit of dysfunction have appeared all over the pitch. There's that defence which he's still kind of juggling with. The midfield, I mean, obviously Kante is a massive loss because he hasn't quite found the, the partnership without Kante. But what Kante does then, his, his major value almost, is when, when a hole appears in the team, which is happening quite regularly this season, Kante can get across to fill it. And um, I still think they've got a bit of an issue, of an issue with uh, Morata. No, he's an excellent player, but I think Costa is maybe still more suited to the style he's trying to play right now. A sort of rough ensemble. Yeah. Well, it, history tells us that Chelsea managers lose in the manner, they, manner that they yeah. did against Roma in midweek. So it's OK, the alarm bells, you're, you're under pressure. That, yeah. That's what history tells us. And obviously we've got the game against Manchester United. And so then, go on. Yeah. yeah, and then, yeah. of course, Manchester United, Mourinho and everything. OK, we, we, we get all that. Um, so is he under pressure? Yeah, he's under pressure. I think partly because, you know, um, the summer was, was, was pretty bad for them all round. I, I, I've got less sympathy with Antonio Conte than, than most people because I think that he read it completely wrong at the end of last season. And he went in there thinking, I'd won the league, I can, I can dictate terms here, I can change Chelsea, which was a bizarre thing to think. He's the head coach, actually, he's not the manager. He's, and so he's not got the power that he, he wants at the club. And obviously there was an element of him trying to get more power from the club. It's just not going to happen at Chelsea. The structure they've got, the way they operate and so on. So I think it was quite fractious over the summer. And it got worse and worse at one stage. I don't buy any of the arguments that they've got a, a weaker squad than they had last summer. They've, they've, they've broken their transfer record. They've spent quite heavily. They've brought in players. Maybe they didn't get all the players he wanted. But if, he goes, if they go to Juventus and say, we, were, uh, we, were, <clears throat> we want Alexandro and they won't sell him, they won't, they won't sell him. You know? And so I think the manager had to work more with the club in terms of the players they brought in. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I've got less sympathy with him in the situation he's in at the moment. Than, and, and I think he has read it all wrong. And that's caused the situation to become even more fractious with the club. So therefore, you have to look at it and think, I find it very difficult for him to be there next season, the way things are at the moment. I think this will be his last campaign at the Chelsea managers. So straight away, you're thinking, well, it, it could be something that happens during the course of the season that he goes. I don't think if they lose to Manchester United today, he, he, he will go or anything like that. But it will just ramp up the pressure even further. Mm -hmm. And then you'll go into the, uh, the international break and it will continue. There'll be more speculation and more talk. And then you'll have to try and, try and improve things after that. OK, we, we believe West Ham have made their contingency plan uh, to replace Bilic with, with David Moyes. Would Chelsea make a contingency plan if I'm sure they, they think pull the trigger on, on yeah, Antonio Conte? I, I don't think they're going to pull the trigger on Conte at the moment, certainly. But I think they will be thinking about what but happens. But three defeats in the Premier League... Losing the Champions League, the draw against Roma yeah. at home. Yeah, so he's got, he's got, he's got to improve things. He's got to, he's got to improve the situation at the club. Um, but I don't think they've reached the point yet where they, where they will be really seriously thinking about what they do next. But they will be thinking about it in terms of after the end of this season, for mm. sure. Because I, I still find it quite difficult to see him being there next season, uh, the way things stand. Mm. Do they call for Carlo? Well, he's not doing much at the minute, is he? Um, I don't know. Um, with and with Jason on on the fact that I don't see Conte there next season because everything everything from the, the summer with the 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 new contract that wasn't a new contract you know it was just sort it's of a, a reevaluation re of the terms yeah, yeah. Um, the way he's been the way he's been speaking almost looks like he's trying to to start a fight with them all the time there was read an interesting piece by Matt Hughes yesterday in the in the Times talking about like you know the the um, the transfer targets that he wanted to try and try and get and, and, and force his will on them and they, they just weren't sort of having it and... That's always a famous one though, isn't it, for managers under pressure? Well, yeah, no, well, I, want, I wanted Messi, <coughs> I wanted Cristiano yeah. Ronaldo, well, I wanted Ramos. Do you not think as well that there's, he, he's suffering this year in terms of um, the time that he's spending on the training ground with them? Because last year he had them like two sessions a, yeah. two sessions a day and the running that they were doing was, was that, incredible. And, and that's apparently an issue going, going right through his career, particularly with Juventus when he first had European football for the first time, that I think the, the players maybe found it, or he found it difficult to adjust his way of coaching to this, to this lesser mm. time. And, and, and that's one of the problems I think they've had this season. He's trying to maintain, I mean, pre he'd preferably have sides to play 100 miles an hour, mm. even if Chelsea weren't always like that last season, but they always had that kind of, that readiness to burst, which is why they were so good in the counter. Um, and he's trying to do the same this season, but it just it just can't work the same way just because of different demands. No. Is there friction with Mourinho? Because when you read the quotes, I had to work miracles, talks about it's the squad that he inherited. Um, is that a very, very deliberate um, attack on, uh, on Mourinho? It doesn't, yeah. doesn't seem to leave much to the imagination, but are you, are you able to assume that, that um, that's what he's talking about? I mean, Conte doesn't do, famously from Italy, he doesn't really do subtlety in the way maybe Mourinho does subtlety in, his, in some of his jibes. 
But I suppose <laughs> I was say, I mean, not, not very subtle. Really. But yeah, <laughs> but I think Mourinho. I think Mourinho is able to kind of maybe twist the knife, have a bit more plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think in Italy they always associate him more with kind of frothing rants rather than the kind of that type of thing. But yeah, it seems very pointed. I don't think he's a great fan of Mourinho. But I think Mourinho, it's almost like he can see that he gets a reaction out of Conte almost now and, and greatly enjoys it, which is often when Mourinho's at his. Is most entertaining. I hope Chelsea but, score today and see his reaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. If, if you're a Premier League manager, of course, we're, we're the four greatest Premier League managers of, course, yeah, of exactly. all time sat round here. Yeah. Um, does, the, would, would, does there have to be friction? Is it just that it's part of the game? You're, it's, it's competitive. You're working at the sharp end, the high, very, very highest level of the game in English football. Um, is there always going to be the tension with opposition managers? I don't think any... any Can they coexist in, in this kind of... No, I... You know, sweet, you know, they're kind of sweet and... Remember, no, I remember speaking to um, Rafa Benitez about this and um, he said, can you be friends with anyone? And he said, well, how, how can... It's, it's impossible. He said, you're never mixing in the same circles. You're all working for your own agenda. You're working for your team. When are you going to socialise and sort of build up that, um, that relationship that you could... Could build a friendship from. Is it we're just we're a, mates, though, aren't we? We were oh, different papers. Best mates. <laughs> Absolutely. But Conte said something similar, didn't he? I think at his press conference the other day, he said that he couldn't. The lonely eggs, yeah. Yeah, he couldn't yeah. be. And I think that's right. I think the, the, when a manager's friends with another manager, it's either he's not in the same league mm. as him, yeah. or or like he's so or, or he is so superior to this other manager that it's fine, mm. or the other manager realizes the other guy is so superior to me. If he sees him as a rival, mm. you can't be friends. No. You can't. Your ego prevents it. Mm. Surely, you cannot be friends with another manager. You can admire their work and maybe privately you get on better than you, than you, than you portray publicly or vice versa, but you can't be friends with them really because they're a rival and they're, it's, just, it's a fierce rivalry between you and other, another we manager. Think and I think some managers sorry. see it as a tool to, to, to undermine their rival. If you go for... When, when Mourinho first came to England, he went for Wenger. He absolutely went for Wenger and he ne he's never stopped, basically. But he went for Wenger because at that stage, Bizarrely, yeah. he saw Wenger as a rival, and obviously doesn't see him as a rival anymore. But he still goes for him. But he, he will go. But, he, but at the moment, he's not going for Guardiola because he wouldn't win that. It's not. It's just not a. That's not, so you can go for somebody if you think you can beat them, and he thinks he can needle Conte. Yeah. So it's a weapon for him to do. It's part. It's part. It's part of the game, isn't it? If he thinks he can yeah. needle the, Conte, and it undermines Conte or undermines like Chelsea today, yeah, yeah. It creates a reaction. Then he's going to do it. Was, it, it if, it, the, if the guy won't react to it, or it's not going to battle, you're going to win. He's not going to do it. And you mentioned when he came in as well. It's interesting. He didn't go for Ferguson. Until no, because the title run in in two exactly. six or seven exactly and the Ronaldo stuff yeah. exactly yeah and but even after that he had to back off because Fergie was then yeah. on, a, on a on a on a better sort of run yeah. with him. Will he have a crack at Pep at some stage though because he's got to try and destabilise and yeah. undermine that Manchester City there team is, before there they is play. Such a, there is such a gap in the way these two teams are playing and the whole kind of he must be hating all the praise that Guardiola is getting and, and 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 Pochettino as well he must be hating I think this is part of his. It's unhappiness the, at the it's moment. It's Daniel Taylor's column this morning, actually. Yeah. He, must, that be, very he, piece. he yeah. must be absolutely loathing this, that the lack of recognition he is getting compared to these other managers who are lauding their football, going about how great Poch... He must be thinking... He talks about all these trophies he's won. Pochettino's won nothing. To save my tea, then. He'll be sitting there. He'll be sitting there thinking, hang on a minute, this guy's won nothing. OK, he beat Real Madrid. He hasn't, he hasn't won anything. This sort of stuff will be eating him up. You must hate it. He it must be, be able to help himself. Yeah. There's one coming with him as soon as... Yeah. The, you, you tell him, seriously telling us that as soon as the uh, that Manchester derby comes around, our oh, Pep's playing great football. I'm really looking forward to locking what, 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 go on the expenditure, I'd say, yeah. something like that. What yeah. I think might happen there is that you won't get an awful lot before the game, and then there'll be the fallout after the game, I think, depending on how it goes. I think because he might be a bit fearful of saying something before the yeah. game because it might come back to bite him. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. afterwards, if, the, if, if, if it goes against them or for them, I think you might start to think, oh, yeah, a little bit of... Mm -hmm whatever about Pep after that. So. Was there some retaliation in Reno's press conference on um, well, Thursday, because that's to be brought forward, of course, yeah. um, ahead, of, ahead of the game against Chelsea. He talks about injuries, injuries, injuries. I'm not a manager who talks about injuries, but Paul Popper, we don't know when he's going to be back. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a strange way he's talking about injuries. Yeah, <laughs> but, but was, was, that, was that aimed at Conte or was that just was oh, that a generalisation? Yeah. Again, that's pretty, it comes back to the kind of the, the double meaning of Mourinho. I mean, he, he's saying it in general terms, but yes, there's very much an edge to it. Mm. Which, which is the way and um, why he's kind of different to Conte in that way. With Conte, when there's a jive, you know it. With Mourinho, again, there's always kind of that double... I mean, again, you know it, but it's not quite as overt. Yeah. Well, just clear up the business with the fans as well, because Old Trafford on Tuesday night, it was uh, noticeable against Benfica. That the fans, there was a section um, in between the Sir Alex Ferguson stand and the school, old school wood end who did sing, sing for him, but not with the same enthusiasm or gusto that, um, that they normally do at Old Trafford. Is that because... 
of what he had said about Lukaku Marcus, and Marcus Rashford the previous weekend when they beat Tottenham at Old Trafford? Like partially, but it was quite a strange fight to pick because mm. up, up, up until... And I, I think I think there'd been no real issue between him and the fans. I think he got them on so, on side, and in that way, he does. I think they, they'd all bought into him, regardless of the football. You're shaking your head, no, 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 I'm agreeing. I'm, I'm agreeing with the guy. Re regardless, <laughs> yeah. But then, the first time I noticed it was at the Spurs game when he took off Rashford and there were boos. That's the first time I noticed Andy. And I think that was more about just just taking off Rashford rather than any kind of tactical decision. And it seems as if he's kind of dwelt on that. A, a, Bit too much, almost. Mm. He's made it. He made an issue there yeah. where it probably didn't yeah. even exist. Exactly. Yeah. And then we had the whole thing about the penalty as mm. well. Who's taking the penalty? It's like, well, why? Why is he making this such an issue? So then you got to start, did he? exactly. So then you got to start wondering why? Why is he making it an issue? Is he? Is he thinking that Lukaku perhaps isn't performing as well as he hoped he would be at this stage? I don't know. Mm. I mean, I, I'd love to get to the bottom of it. I tried. I spent quite a lot of time last week trying yeah. to find out exactly what is eating him up at the moment because it seems to me there are three or four things that have happened yeah. around the last few weeks. Which would add up to something else. There's something else going on there that maybe he's not happy. Maybe it's to do with his contract or something. I don't know. But I'm trying to find out. Well, he's I've not been... short of a few quid, is he? Exactly. Sorry. But I've been trying to find out what, what the issue is. But it seems to me that when you're in this kind of like mood at the moment, yeah. it maybe it's because tax case as well. I don't know. But there, are, there is something going on there that seems to be. These are all kind of little sort of public signs of something else going on. Well, right? I'm told it's the Anfield result. It's, it's the draw at Anfield when yeah. he got the stick. It was merciless on the back page of the papers on, on yeah. the Sunday. Um, when actually Liverpool were the home side, the onus yeah. was on them, yeah. um, and Klopp effectively got away with that one, but Mourinho definitely didn't. No. That's what I'm told it stems back. That's, yeah. that's, the, well, that's yeah. the sort of beginning you know of it. He, des he, des he deserved the stick at Liverpool, yeah. and, I'm, and well, I'll, I'll, tell agree, you, yeah. I'll tell you why. That Liverpool team that he came to that day, short of confidence, had, has had defensive problems and were there to be got at. They were there to be got at, and whether he was frightened about Liverpool sort of getting at them, but he spent huge amounts of money on that team. They were there to be got at that day, and if, they, if, if Manchester United want to win the league, they've got to win at Liverpool. Liverpool aren't going to win. Liverpool aren't going to win the league this year. Liverpool aren't even title contenders this year. But Manchester United are, also the, 100%. Yeah. And the nature of now, you have to win more of those top six games. Yeah. Just because every four games... And the same you're... afternoon, Manchester, Manchester, they scored seven, City scored yeah. seven yeah. that afternoon. Yeah. They had one well, he shot... Couldn't predict, they he couldn't been... predict that. No, <laughs> no, I know, but if he's been to Anfield twice with Manchester United, and in that period, they've had two shots on target in two games. Yeah. Come on, that's not. That, uh, do you, that's do not. 30 yards between Lukaku and Mkhitaryan. Mm. And there's this wider debate about how Ferguson needs to play that football. Ferguson, very, very occasionally, I mean, I think the, the most famous one I can think of is the Barca away in 07 08 when they sat back really, really, really deep. But I think there's, that's the only time I can really Ferguson playing t the way Mourinho did at Anfield to that extent. Yeah. There was always a bit more to it. It was strong defence, but with a, a bit mm. more edge to it. And there wasn't well, these. There was a game United played, um, I, think it was, I think it was 10 years ago, when John O'Shea scored in the last minute. That was the uh, yeah, well, game. Yeah. yeah, it was, you know, they, they'd soaked everything up mm -hmm. and then, then hit them, like, with the with the, the, the counter right at the end. But you never got any sense that United were going to go for it then. I mean, his final substitution was a central defender. I know you're not having me with looking at that face, <laughs> but here we go. <laughs> you're a hard man to play, on your hot It's a good result. OK, um, we're talking about more managers under pressure at the bottom of the table next. Though, Statue of Liberty Stadium, Paul Clement, is he going to survive at Swansea and Tony Pulis at West Brom as well? They lost at Huddersfield yesterday. Welcome back with us this morning, Jason Burt, Miguel Delaney, and a very spiky Dominic King. Um, let's just remind you what's in the uh, paper. I thought you'd have a comeback for me then. No, no, I thought you were talking about me here. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a look at um, here today, gone tomorrow. This is Slavin Bilic. Um, in, he's done for, according to the Suns, goals pull out this morning, beaten 4-1 by Liverpool yesterday. Um, he's about to be replaced by David Moyes, we think. Um, the man on Sunday sports section, don't get cocky. That's uh, Gareth Southgate's message. For England's triumphant under-17 side, they won the World Cup um, last week. We're coming, on, we're coming on to them in part four of today's programme. Uh, today's games, Antonio Conte had to work miracles last season with Mourinho's side, the side he inherited from Mourinho. But Conte is going to make some changes this afternoon for that game against United. David Luiz facing the chop, according to Mike McGrath this morning, and Gary Cahill as well, uh, axed for that game at Stamford Bridge. Uh, Mourinho we thought he was on his way to PSG. He's not. He's signing a new contract with a £3 million a year um, uh, increase on his salary, according to the Sunday Mirror this morning. Managers on the brink as well. Tony Pulis lost at Huddersfield yesterday. We're coming on to him in a moment, but first I want to talk about events at the Statue of Liberty Stadium. 
uh, American ownership, of course. Yeah. Uh, Hugh Jenkins, still the chairman, um, still, of course, um, effectively director of football down mm. there. Uh, but the fans, they're going mad at the results, not happy with the results. Lost again yesterday, um, this time at home to Brighton. Uh, what are the problems down there? It seems to be muddle thinking. Uh, it looks like they're not quite sure what, what, what they're doing. We, st we talk about Swansea way, and we just don't know which way... The they've Swansea lost their way. They've lost their way. We don't know which way Swansea are going at the moment. I'd start off by saying Paul Clement did a fantastic job last season. I think he got 28 points in the second half of the season, when really they were on the floor, and he turned them round and, and saved them, and did an absolutely brilliant job. But then they seem to have gone into the summer not quite knowing what, what, what they were going to do. So, the whole Gilfie Sigurdsson thing obviously caused a lot of problems for them. Now, Swansea would turn around and say, we didn't get the bid till quite late from Everton. It, the money... This is their argument, yeah, yeah. Don. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't. But, but it did obviously then have a knock-on effect in terms of what, what then happened for mm -hmm. them in terms of the recruitment, as did Lorente as well, because they let him go right at the end of the window. They bring in Wilfred Bonney quite late in the window. Now, he, he, they could have done that deal quite a lot earlier and got him in and got him fit and got him playing again. And there just seem to be players coming in there, like Rocky Messer and so on, the, the midfielder. You think, well, where do they sort of fit into it? So when that starts to happen, you're wondering who's signing the players. You know, is it the owners? Is it the, the Hugh Jenkins? Or is it Paul Clement? Is it a mixture of the three? It probably is a mixture of the three. And therefore, it looks like a, an unbalanced squad. Renato Sanchez comes in. Again, everyone's saying it's a coup, but he, he clearly wasn't ready to, to go into the, the mm. team. So you're looking at it and thinking straight away, they haven't really plugged the gaps. They haven't built a squad that's fit for purpose in terms of what they need to do. So then, you, then you're asking the question of, you know, who, 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 is, who is driving that? And it doesn't appear to be a very joined up way of doing mm. things and they're suffering because of it and it's been like this for a couple of years I mean and obviously they suffer because of the, the turnover of managers they made some very poor managerial appointments I think they've made a good managerial appointment now and I hope that Paul Clement gets the chance to, 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 to get them back up the table because he, he earned that from what he did last season mm. they would have gone down without him but at the moment it just seems to be a very muddled situation and we're not quite sure which direction they're heading and they've lost their way. Mm. But that, that muddled thinking as well it, it's, it feels like it's a reflective of a wider problem that basically every club in Swansea situation faces and I, I think it's a kind of a uniquely modern problem in that because the Premier League is so boxed off there's kind of these ten mid, middle yeah. mid, mid table teams they all they all have a ceiling essentially. So what can you do within that ceiling? And uh, Swansea probably had a perfect while in that they had, a, they had a very focused, good structure. But they were also playing good football that essentially gave their fans a bit of hope, which is probably the best. And yeah. West Brom, maybe the other side of them, we'll come to that in a bit. And they won a cup as well. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. But that is because of the nature of Premier League. It's probably only sustainable for so long. Then it reaches a bit of a plateau, and that's probably the problem they have now. Mm. Mm. OK, you mentioned West Brom and uh, Tony Pulis. Uh, the fans uh, yesterday at Huddersfield singing, um, you're getting sacked in the morning about their own manager. Um, I think they were singing Tony Pulis is a football genius or words to that effect mm -hmm. um, last season um, when they had a mid-table finish. Um, are West Brom fans just bored of Tony Pulis, bored of life under him, bored of the football they're playing? There's probably, yeah, probably a bit of that. And, you know, people can say, you know, be careful what you wish for and all that. But at the same time, what's football about, really? It's about, I mean, it's... Uh, it's escapism or a diversion from life that and people want to feel a sense of hope and enjoyment at what they're watching and they, they want the idea that they can go further and with Pulis' football it just feels you know as, as good as it is to keep aside in the Premier League what's the next step then? Okay outside of the top four teams there's the Manchester City are purring at the moment of course okay we accept that outside of the top four teams how many times a season do fans of uh, Watford, Leicester West Brom, Wait, Southampton, yeah. go to walk away from a game and think, wow, I've just seen something. That's what I, that's what I come to, to football for. How many times a season do fans walk away from a game saying that? that I mean, that's probably if, true. If they're, outside, if they're supporters of those types yeah. of clubs with those profiles. I'd say quite a few, but it's not unfair for fans to want that. Or it's not unreasonable. I, I think Jacob Steinberg actually in The Guardian did a piece in this but last It's unreasonable week. when it's not reasonable, because you, your expectations is you can't meet, you can't meet. Well, it, but it's... it's it's not unreasonable to want that, though. Now, ne ne whether as really a fantasy, yeah. No, as a fantasy. <laughs> as, like, as, some, as something you're, you should... I mean, other clubs have achieved it. I think it's something you, you can push for, or, or the fans can uh, re reasonably ask their club to strive for. If not, I mean, it, it should be an objective. But, yeah, I think Jacob Steinberg did a piece in The Guardian last week about how uh, it, must, it feels like a kind of a, an odd time in the Premier League in which there are more clubs unhappy with, their, with what their side is doing than pretty much ever before. There's a kind of a general I think, I think part of the problem with managers like Tony Pulis and, and, and another, at another end of the scale, Jose Mourinho, is if, if you take away, if you don't get the results, what, you, what you're left with, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think that's the problem. You say how many times will they go away being happy? Well, they'll be happy if they win. 
They'll be happy if they win under most circumstances, really, to be honest. But if you're not winning and you're just losing, then what are you left with? You're left with quite turgid football that's actually quite boring. Well, we're losing anyway, so what, what have we got left there that's, that's sort of sustaining our mm. interest in this team? And, yes, to a certain degree, fans become a little bit complacent. They've been in the Premier League a few years. We want more. Stoke City went through that, didn't they? Obviously under Pulis as well. So I think sometimes you think, well, what, what have we got beyond just staying in the Premier League? And it's a difficult argument because then suddenly you might take a risk and you're in the releg relegation battle. Do you want that either? But I think when you take away the results, if you're not getting the results, what are you left with? That's it. It's basically just existing and no one goes to watch football, they just exist. I, I've seen you drinking down the wing for the England press team uh, when, you, when you turned your back on your country to play for England. Um, I, I can't work out what sort of manager you'd be, whether you'd be pragmatic or you'd have sort of Chrissy Waddle style flair drinking down the left wing. I'd, I'd be the latter. Yeah, definitely. I may not look like it, but I would be the... <laughs> yeah, you'd uh, win I'd, every week, five... Well, not about winning win every week, but I'd try to win every week, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd, okay. be, I'd be um, a dreamer. <laughs> we're all dreamers <laughs> on this table. Um, I want to move on to Everton as well, because they are looking for a new manager. Yeah. Um, a lot of talk about Sean Dyche at Burnley. Um, I had a bit of sympathy for Burnley and their supporters yesterday, because they had a good result, and yet they were told straight after the game, unlucky. Your manager's leaving. Is, is Sean Dyche going to be the next Everton manager? I think it's between... Um, him and Sam Allardyce at the minute. Um, they would be the the two front runners from the, the discussions that are taking place this week. Um, Everton are in a really. I know we've been talking about crisis and They've things like that. Relegation, but you said West Ham. <laughs> uh, this this game today, I think, is the biggest league game Everton have probably played for ten years. And I know that might sound a bit of a an overreaction after ten games in, but at the minute, it just feels like. The, the dream that was there at the start of the summer when they, they did all the, the excellent early work, getting seven signings in, is gone. It's just like the life's been sucked out of them. Um, they have no forward. Uh, that was the, the, the biggest mistake that they, they made. Uh, they went down, um, they thought, they, well, Koeman thought that he had Giroud, uh, but there was no backup plan after that, and they're now, they're now paying for it. Um, they just... The th Everton are at their best when there's a connection between the fans and the players and the management and it's like, it makes them a force and it makes Goodison Park one of the hardest stadiums in the, in the country to go to and they can beat anybody when, when the, the atmosphere is up. And at the minute, if you go into the stadium, it's dead. There's, just, like, it, there's no sort of fight or anything about them and it's, it's really sort of jarring because that's not what Everton's about. Tom, there's been a lot of talk about what you just said, the, this... The emotional bond between the mm. club, the stadium, the history there, of course, we know all about it, the supporters, the manager. Mm. Why, why do you think it's different for Everton to other clubs? Just, it's been yeah. presented as being different, isn't it? In the same well, way that the, the Newcastle store, the, fans are, they're the best fans in the world. Yeah. You know, it's, we hear that. Why, why do you say that about Everton? Because there's, it's just a feeling of when, when, when you go there and it's, it's a... The, the stadium's a throwback to how football used to be and the chairman mm -hmm. um, and the people that are involved have these these values that are very traditional and they want... That's why they want David Unsworth to, to succeed because he he gets Everton, he knows what the club's about and, the, you know, you see the, the old players around the place and it's there's this feel that it's just a... It's a proper football club. But you were the, there on Thursday night, what happened? Uh, the play... The, they caved in again. Um, for the fourth or fifth time, a 1-0 defeat became really heavy. Um, and that, to me, says there's, there's problems with um, the mentality of some of the, um, the bigger players. Um, so you've seen some of them walking out afterwards with, the, with the, the hoodies up and not wanting to sort of speak about or, or front up for what's gone on. I mean, there was, there was 3,000 Evertonians in the stadium. There was probably more same amount who didn't have tickets in the town. Leon was supposed to be the big game of the of being back in Europe and it turned into an absolute shambles. Mm. Who do you think should get the job? <sighs> I th Daesh would be would be the one I'd go with because he's um he's hungry. I think he needs to make the next step up. Um has he earned it? Yeah, I think he's done a, he's done a, a superb job at Burnley. Um, but how much further can he, he, he take them? Uh, with with Sam, um, I'm not sure the fan uh, 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 the fans would take to him straight away. But he, he is available. He will get them out of out of trouble. He will make them organised. Like like his, 
We spoke about David Moyes before. Um, but they, they, they need to make decisive action quickly. Mm. Well, what's interesting with Dyche, I think, is if he doesn't get this job, well, and he wants, yeah. if he does want to leave Burnley, if he doesn't get this job, what, what job is he going to get? You know, I mean, I think he's always linked. He's often linked to jobs. I mean, Leicester recently, before that, go, going back Palace, Villa, uh, Villa mm. and then it just, just doesn't happen. And I'm not quite sure it's because he wants to stay or people turn elsewhere. Or, but he, if it doesn't happen this time for him, and obviously I'm not sort of saying he should definitely leave Burnley or anything, but if it doesn't happen this time for him, I don't, I don't know when it happens yeah. for him, really. Also, mm. where, where Burnley are on the table right now, can his stock ever be higher unless exactly. he wins a trophy? It's almost like the stock market in that sense, the managerial mm. race. You know, he'd be, get, he'd be getting out with such a high at, um, at yeah. Burnley, but yet, is everything maybe, with the situation they're in now, in now, is that the right situation for kind of a, a manager progressing in his career to go to? Yeah, well, I think it's important to make the point mm. as well as that whoever comes in, they still have the problems that, yeah. that Ronald Koeman has. They haven't got anyone to score the goals. Yeah. They're not going to have the chance to address that until January. And then, if, if, if we're going to be honest about this, if you're a striker and you're looking at Everton, you're going to think, mm, relegation battle, I'm not sure. And I also yeah. think there's some concern over the structure at Everton as well, isn't there? Who's mm. calling the shots, really? Mm. Yeah. OK, um, decision time for Everton. Um, Dom thinks they'll choose either Sam Allardyce or Sean Dyche, which will unfold over the next few days. OK, next up we're going to talk England, because the Axeman, Gareth Southgate, has been in action this week. He's been ruthless ahead of the prestige friendlies against Germany um, coming up and Brazil next week at Wembley. More on that next. Um, Sunday Times this morning, uh, Dominic King making me laugh as we came back there. Um, <laughs> first time for everything. Um, Alex Oxley chamberlain uh, timing's everything. Uh, Gareth Southgate named his England squad for the games against Germany um, this week and then Brazil next week at Wembley. Um, there's no Ox, he said he's a victim of his position and the new system that yeah. Gareth's going to play um, for these, these two games, which is kind of 3-5-2 or variation uh, um, of that. Um, so, some of the other big names, along with Alex Oxley chamberlain you got any? Have you got any sympathy for them? Of course, Chris Morning is another one of them. No, no, no. I think it's time. I mean, I think you know you get your You're opportunity. A man as well, aren't you? <laughs> I think you get your. No, it's not. It's not. The door's not closed to these guys. But I mean, I think it was interesting when he spoke about Chris Morning, for example. And he, he basically said he doesn't. He doesn't bring the ball out of the defence well enough. Yeah. Doesn't pass the ball well enough. But Phil Jones and Gary Cahill do. Well, he obviously feels they do, and I think that I don't have a problem with the manager making a decision. Mm -hmm. I really don't. And I think if he's going to if he's going to be the manager of England and he's going to be sort of judged on what he does at the World Cup up and beyond, then he needs to do it the way he wants to do it. And I think there's no point being a nice guy, there's no point yeah. playing lip service to people. I think there comes a time when you think, well, actually, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make the change I want to make. And he's quite clear on Thursday when he spoke to us that it was about getting through qualification, which he's done, and now, now I'm going to try and do it a bit more my way, which I think is fantastic. And if he's choosing a system in which he wants to play with three at the back or five at the back, he brings back Ashley Young, who's 32 years old, he hasn't played for England for four years, people can argue about that, but he can play wing back. He can, so he's actually picking players to play his system which is a bit different for England. I've not yeah. seen that before. You choose a system and think, well, I'll pick the players to play my system rather than I've got these players, what system do I play? And I think that's, that's refreshing. And I think, I, maybe, I think it's maybe a little bit premature on some of the ones he's brought in, like Gomez and Abraham. It's a little bit early, loft his cheek. But some of the players he's left out, there's, I can't see a case for any of them being in there anyway. So they've got to prove themselves. So Oxford Chamberlain played well yesterday, had a good game. Doesn't mean he can't go to the World Cup. He just means he's got to play well from now on. He knows what Oxley Chamberlain can, can do. He's given him plenty of opportunities. He's done the same with all the other players in that squad. And now he's looked at it and thought, well, actually, I want to play this system and with these players, I'm going to give it a go. And I, and I think, well, well, well done. I, I really, I thought, you know, yeah, fair enough. Did, did he get carried away, though? Harry Winks into his squad, brought into his squad um, last month. He was excellent. He's had an excellent month for Tottenham, played twice against Real Madrid, and he's been superb in both those games as well. But did England, did England's head coach get carried away with Winks, thinking... Actually, I can do the same with other young players as well. No, I think um, I think last month might have been a line in the sand for him with the, with those two performances, and, th and, he, and he's thought to himself, uh, as Jason just said, I'm going to do it my way, and, and the, um, I'm going to get the players to do it. I think he's 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 playing a bit of a long game as well. I mean, no one's going to sit around this table and, and even try and suggest that England are going to get to deep in the World Cup next year, or are we? Are we? I, I, no. I'm I know what I'm I think it's a better team. Yeah, well, yeah. What, what, what it's, it's not, I, 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 I get well, a little bit so. fed up with this kind of like yeah. um, England haven't got, haven't got the players and, and you know, expectations. Mm. If you look at that 11, if you base that 11 on Tottenham and Manchester City, mm. that's not a bad 11. Yeah. It's not no, a bad yeah. 11. But what, what I was going to say is, I think with, with the Gomez coming in and Tammy Abraham and people like that, they're all 20, you know, 19, 20, whatever. 
he's maybe looking at the Euros or Qatar and thinking, well, you know, they're going to they're going to develop together. They're going to develop together. Let I'm, them have. I've got, got less. I've got, got less sympathy with that person. Yeah, right, I think well, we've been down this road with yeah, the biggest England manager. Yeah. I, I, don't, I can't take much more of that jam tomorrow business. Yeah, I agree with that. Actually, I think if the, these players have got to be in on merit now, I haven't got long left. I don't. I don't think Gareth Southgate should turn England into the twenty-one. But if, he, but if he's doing if he's doing alongside uh, fashioning the the current team, I don't, I don't yeah. see a problem with it. And I think what's very admirable about Southgate actually is that it, it does often feel like for the last two decades in particular that. England, Roma, the England team has almost been conditioned and driven by these kind of wider debates and factors that are really kind of, to an extent, meaningless. Stuff like the captaincy and, and yeah. that sort of thing. And Southgate doesn't have any time for any of that. He just, he's, and he's very single-minded, like, this is right for this team and beyond the rest of it. Mm. It's, See, Harry, Harry Winks is interesting to me because I, I think there could be a player who actually just might, just might be really perfect for international football. Yeah. Just might be, we haven't got that many types of players. I mean, maybe we're getting a bit too carried away with him and he's, he's obviously very, very you know, young into his career, but... I think you sometimes can make a case for being man of the match against yeah, Real Madrid. There are sometimes there are players who actually you think, okay, he might not even always be in the Tottenham team, but actually for England, he might just be the one who you put in there. And you think he will make a difference for that England team, and I think, mm. well, why not? If he's the right player, then put him in. Yeah. Then put him in and let him play. He's 21. Let him play. He's been really well schooled by Pochettino, looked after, brought through, and Pochettino has shown it time and time again. He is brave enough to put these young players in. So if he's brave enough to do it, in the pressure of the Premier League then England should be brave enough to do it as well. Just the other thing as well, though, he's not, he's not as if he's, he's gambling with... He's gambling the right word. Um, he knows them. He's, he's, had, he's seen them developing through the age group, so he knows exactly what they can do. He knows what type of character he's going to be dealing with in terms of them coming into the squad. He wouldn't sort of over-promote people to get himself headlines because he's, mm. he's not that type of man. He's not bothered about the, the, the agendas and making himself look good. He wants England to do well. Mm. Um. You've seen a lot of Joe Gomez. Yeah. Talk, just tell us a little bit about his his development at Liverpool and, of course, uh, with England's under twenty ones as well. Yeah. Um, well, when he's played, for, he's been playing central def uh, in central defence for um, for the twenty ones, and he's one of those players that you see at that level that that stands out a mile. He, he looks like so much better than the, the, the level that is around him. He obviously had a, a horrendous knee injury um, two years ago. He's fought back from that. He came back a little bit heavy last year, um, and they reconditioned him in terms of the, the program that he was doing. And he's he's a lot more leaner now, and whatnot. and he started the the season terrific at, at right back. He was man of the match against Arsenal, uh, superb last week against Huddersfield, um, and he's a player that he's going to go he's going to go a long way. I think mm. he's a, he's a very very encouraging player. Yeah. And, and Southgate sees him as a, a centre half, a right yeah. side of centre half. So in that three, he sees him as somebody who can play. That. So, so again, it's an example of picking a player who will hopefully fit the system you want mm. to play. Mm. Uh, Deli Alley out this quad as well, we think, because he's he's missing from the um, game against Palace with injury. Mm. Um, but we, we've Poch, uh, sorry, Gareth Southgate has seen enough of Deli Alley to know that he's going to build the team around him yeah. as well. That he's such an important part of this this England side. But who else? Caught your eye in that England squad. Um, I mean, again, I know it's an easy one, but it is. It's, it's hard to get beyond the, the wing situation, just because I think he, I, I think it'd be England's st starting centre midfielder for this uh, for this World Cup. I think it, he's the he's the one player that's that, of that exact profile that's been missing. Um, I mean, I, I, as you mentioned, they're kind of bringing through some of the younger players as well. Mm. Um, the Loftus Cheek inclusion was, was, was that, that was a little sort bit of like yeah. it, that really came from left field because he's been. He's been injured for most of the season, yeah. hasn't he? He's pulled out of the last two 21 squads, missed the tournaments in the summer. But isn't but he a little bit like Gomez? You said Gomez, when he played for the 21s, looked to cut above. When yeah. Loftus Cheek has yeah, played for the 21s, he's looked like that as well, hasn't he? He looked yeah. like somebody's mm. almost yeah. outgrown that level. Mm. So if you think, well, he's done well at that level, then maybe again it might be. We talk about, you know, he hasn't done so much for P Palace this season, but actually, again, he could be a player who's almost better suited to going and playing for his country. Mm. Yeah. Some of the old guard, Joe Hart is in that um, England squad, conceded four yesterday, yeah. um, look, looks shaky. Does, does Gareth, you know where I'm coming, don't yeah, you? Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? <sighs> well, go on, go on, George. Does Gareth Southgate stick with him for Germany and Brazil? I'd does he play him? I'd play Jordan Pickford. Would you? Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. He's had a busy season. He has had a busy season, but he's the, he's, the one, he's the one player um, He's the one player that was signed by Everton this summer that you can say that, you know what, I'm, I'm doing exactly what I should have been. Um, he's, had a couple of, he's had a couple of rash moments, but um, I, think he's, I think he's an excellent keeper and 
two or three years down the line, he'll be England's number one, and there won't even be an argument about it. Really? That good? Hmm? Yeah, he's, he's really good. Butland's got something to say. Butland, about yeah, that, Butland's good, but I, I know from. Um, I remember when they called him up for uh, Pickford made his, his debut for the 21s in the game against America two years ago at uh, Preston, and they were talking about him then and saying this kid's gonna, this kid's gonna go far. And everything that I've, I've seen of him, mentality, um, talent, I think he's, he's he's got all the tools to do it. Yeah. Okay. Good for him. Um, what do we expect? Southgate to learn from these games. Germany, of course, at uh, the weekend on Friday, well, followed, followed by swiftly against Brazil on Tuesday. I mean, it was a big one, maybe, given how the qualification has gone and, you know, really the relative ease they, they qualified with is how they cope against kind of these bigger, better, better nations, I suppose you might say, in terms of the quality. But we're not going to re really learn too much from that because of the squad he's picked. I think that's what it's really about. It's about because, well, it's about evolving the system he's put in place, but also maybe finding a few little alternatives and, get, and testing those alternatives against this, this kind of class. I think it's also realising that they're not, when England have the ball, they're not good enough. They haven't been good enough with the ball. Yeah. So this system, hopefully, allows you to be more of a counter-attacking yeah. approach. He's quite good at that after the Lithuanian yeah, game. They're going like to do that against Germany and Brazil, and he's going to see what it's like when they have less than 50% yeah. of the ball, mm -hmm. if they can actually do well yeah. in the game. Mm -hmm. And that might be the template he then takes to Russia. Mm -hmm. Does he, so you're saying the Germany and Brazil games, he accepts, Southgate accepts he won't have 50% of the ball? Yeah, I, I think he'll expect them to, to have more of the possession than, than, than England will. And then to see... Look, Tottenham beat Real Madrid on, on Wednesday with less than 50% of the possession, mm -hmm. you know. That's the example, just yeah. to follow. Okay. And, and they, in, in essence, dominated the game without having the ball. Mm. All right, we want to talk about another uh, level, England level now. It's the under-17s. I just want to touch on them because, of course, they won the um, World Cup last week, Don. Um, in the papers this morning, Gareth Southgate talked about them. He says, don't get cocky, don't get carried away because uh, the pictures of them celebrating last week, they turned their shirts around so clearly you could see the names of every one of the players. Uh, most people wouldn't recognise the players who associate mm. them with the shirt that they were wearing. Um, which is presumably why, or applause, certainly a plausible explanation of why they did it. Uh, to be fair on balance to Southgate, he does say in a moment of ecstasy, yeah, yeah. he can understand it. However, going forward, mm. you know, let, let's not get too carried away. Um, what are your thoughts on what they did? Yeah, um, Danny Murphy said something about uh, mm. something similar yeah. at, at the start of the week, didn't he? Um, um, I, don't, I don't sort of have a problem with, with, with what he said. Um, I mean, what he said or what they did? <laughs> Well, with, 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 Murphy I, I, said. No, with, 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 what, with what Gareth said in terms of, um, uh, you know, remember what, what, who you're playing for going yeah. forward. Listen, the, we'll see how kids celebrate, you know, and they've, yeah. they've been... I don't have, a, I don't have any kind of it, problem it, with it. Did not win? Exactly, but yeah. <laughs> I think won it's the World I, Cup. I mean, uh, why, why are we giving them a slap? Yeah. Well, I just don't it, think I it's don't necessary think so. at all. I, I, they won the World Cup at, the, at under-17. They're kids. Yeah. yeah. They won no, the World I, that's, Cup. I, that's what I was, I was just about to say. The kids celebrate and yeah. we don't have a problem with what they've done. If it was later on in life and they're doing exactly. it, then you'd have a problem with well, it. Uh, now, there's, there's no sort of issue. I think it's unfair for maybe the general public or pundits to have a go at them, but it is one of those things that you, you, you heard about a million times with Ferguson with United, that it's, it's okay for a manager to say it and it's okay for the national team manager to say it because it's almost rem reminding them, hang on, you've not made it yet. Mm. It's not about yet. But I think in, for, for everyone else, I yeah. think it's, uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and to be fair, Stephen Gerrard as well has been, he's spoken this week about Brewster and said, you know, mm. you've done great, you know, do it again for the, yeah, for yeah. the big team. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, you ready for part five? Ready for part <laughs> you know what's coming? I think so. It's the Pep and Potch lovings coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, let's talk uh, Mauricio Pochettino now. They're in action, Tottenham in action against Crystal Palace at Wembley this afternoon. Um, uh, he's written a love letter. Um, My darling Spurs. Um, it's in the sun this morning. Uh, yours adoringly, Mauricio Pochettino. This is off the back of their superb win against Real Madrid. Um, Miguel, he said in his press... This is all his yeah. press conference, but the Sun's just having a little bit of fun with it. Ahead of that Palace game, saying the most important club in the world is Tottenham. Uh, that's where I belong. Um, uh, the emotion is real. I can't be a fake to, but today for me... Tottenham is 100%, and then the Sun very amusingly say cut out and keep <laughs> to remind Potts when Real Madrid uh, come calling. Would he turn them down? Um, that's a difficult question. I mean, because it, it actually, it did, what he said on, on Friday at his press conference felt very conspicuous given that everyone thought in the last three weeks when they, when they had a double header against Real Madrid, he was on a massive charm offensive with the Spanish media and with Real Madrid, going so far as beating them so well. Um, but so it, it it did feel so pointed that suddenly started going on about the kind of the project he's building at Spurs, the uh, what he's trying to do there. But again, it's uh, 
<laughs> it's, it's Real Madrid. Mm, I don't think it'll just be Real Madrid as well either. Yeah, so yeah. the thing, I mean, I think there'll be other clubs who'll be looking at him more and more. You know, mm. Paris Saint Germain. You know, other clubs as well thinking about it. So his, his stock is is rising all the time. So he'll know. It's partly, possibly, you know, a way of of, of trying to leave him more more out of Tottenham. Mm. Really, I, I do wonder with him personally, though, as well. Where he, I think he he quite enjoys this like this. Asset of, or his facet of management in terms of that he's actually building something, he's not just taking over a massive team. And this idea that he can really kind of defy the you know the way football is these days and, and actually win something with Spurs. And I think that's what it, and that's why I mean, there's been so much debate about his uh, his perspective on the League Cup, but I actually think it's it's quite clever in the sense that he knows that if Spurs, because of the size Spurs are, if they're kind of you know distracted or deviated by other competition that saps their ability to actually do something that many people consider impossible. Now, you know, people can argue whether they have the right... I, th I think he was wrong in the League Cup, I've got to say. I mean, that's a trophy you can win. You know, it's a trophy you can well, win. You win the trophy and then you move on. I think that's what you do. I think yeah. it's not, they haven't won such, yeah. such a long time. He's going to get beaten over his head until he wins a trophy. And if he wins a trophy, you can start from there. That's okay. why I believe. For, forgive me, um, Man City, top of the table. Beat Napoli in the Champions League, yeah. uh, top of Serie A. Wallop them in yeah. the week into the next round of the um, Carabao yep. Cup, but I get a sense that there's more affection in this country for Poch than there is for Pep. Why is that? Is that fair? Is yeah. that correct? And why would that be the case? Yeah, I think um, I think you're right with that. Might be the first time I've ever reviewed it. <laughs> uh, no, I think I think it is. Yeah, yeah. it probably is. Yeah. No, I th um, it just he comes across well, Pochettino, doesn't he? He's, he's made. Jason's point is, well, you haven't won a trophy yet. Yeah, I know. Well, uh, have I finished? <laughs> <laughs> the floor's <laughs> yours. Right. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to become the manager um, like Keegan at Newcastle or that Leeds team with O'Leary that everybody says is brilliant, but they never end up winning something. I don't think he will end up like that. I think, mm. there are, I think that they will win something. They're too good of a team not to. They've got too many good players. Um, I think the thing with, with Guardiola is... Um, it's kind of expected with him, isn't it? He's, he's come in and we know what we knew what Barcelona did, we knew what Bayern Munich did. Um, he's been given unbelievable financial backing to get exactly what he wanted. And if, listen, fair play to him, they're playing some amazing football. Um, they're, they're probably the best team in Europe. They should be the favourites to win the Champions League, um, contrary to what he says. Um, but I just, I, I just think that there's, there's just something that the, the Pochettino has that, that just makes him but, a but more also, sort of likable character. Also a huge element of this. I mean, let's be, let's be, let's be honest. There are a huge number of people who just want Guardiola for fat, fat yeah, yeah. face, don't they? I mean, he's done it at Barcelona mm -hmm. and Bayern. I mean, it's a lot of people are sitting there thinking, you know, yeah. we want you to fail. Yeah, we uh, want you to prove that you're not as good as you well, are. And there's two elements of that as well. There's both this idea that he's coming over. That, well, he was gifted a team before this, which I think is wrong. Yeah. And, and this, that he's, he's so vaunted as coach, but also probably the money city have as well. But in terms of Guardiola as well, I think I think more people were open to him when he first arrived than maybe he feels. But I think mm. what, put, what put a lot of people off was last season when he was kind of a little passive aggressive when things weren't going their way. <laughs> I think that that has influenced it a little he's, bit. He's, but he's, has, he, has Guardiola ever presented himself? OK, we can say his mm. success at Barcelona and say, what an amazing job, he's one of the world's super coaches and he's always referred to in that manner. Um, same with Bayern Munich. But does he present himself as... A super coach, as someone who's got superior tactical intellect. I think than he's, more of a else. he's more of a oh, fundamentalist. Yeah. He just this is my idea. Take yeah, it. I agree it. with that. I agree. He won't bend. That's yeah. that's the interesting thing about him. He won't he won't sort of play the game almost. You know, we kind of expect him to sort of play this game a bit more in terms of talking like as you say almost Neil. But I think he is what he is. He you never know? puffs himself. No, he doesn't well, puff I, himself. Up. Maybe no. I'm wrong. No, he doesn't. I, You're absolutely right. I don't get the impression. You're absolutely when, when right. You're absolutely he right. And, and, absolutely right. I totally agree with you. And I think. Why, I, why I've got an awful lot of time for him is not just the fact that, yeah, yes, they, they've got a very, very good team, but he has improved every single player in that squad. Absolutely, yeah. 100%. In the way he did it by Munich and the way he did it at Barcelona, and that's the end of it, as far as I can see. He is a fantastic coach because he does that. doesn't matter about the money. I think the fact is they are better players for him, and there are very few coaches you can yeah. say that. Pochettino's another one, but there are very few you can say that about. I do think, though, there's a, he's clever in terms of the things that he, that, that he says. Um, because He said one the other day about... Um, and it was one of those quotes that you look at and says, does he, does he really mean that about um, they've only got four players that have they've competed in the Champions League or four players that have been oh, at that yeah, level? Yeah. The team that he picked in Napoli on Tuesday night 
had a combined tally of 353 Champions League appearances. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. so you know, and they got to semi-final. Yeah, it's, it's things like that that just sort of like you know. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Also, by the same token, he, he still has this slight air that he's coming into City and they're they're a club I have to build their history for. Mm. There's an element of that, even though like mm. <laughs> won league titles in the past. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, in terms of Pep's transition or the improvement at City this season, what what for you would be the main, the, the biggest single factor that's well, contributed I, towards their success so far? And I think well. For, uh, Basically, the players understand the system more. I think the biggest effect that has had is that I remember, I remember last season, particularly the two-all draw at home against Spurs, where suddenly, just out of nowhere, this hole would appear in the team and like Spurs were racing through it. Whereas now, because the players understand what he wants them to do so much more, that isn't happening. They're much more cohesive. They're moving more. And then, and also, I think they're actually creating near enough to the same amount of ch clear cut chances last season, but they've just been so much yeah, more ruthless. That, that's uh, a and, massive thing. Yeah. And I think that has a lot to do with the simple fact that they've suddenly got a lot of the time two finishers in the box in Aguero and, and Jesus and that's no longer, it, that no longer feels like a compromise to get Aguero in it's something that actually works really really well mm. I think they have but, and, and also they had a, another good transfer window I think yeah. they, 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 they solved some of the problems they had and the, the, the fullbacks were the big issue weren't they but he tried to get through with one year because all those fullbacks were coming at the end of the contract and he thought I'll try and get through for this one season but he couldn't do that obviously Walker and Mendy coming in has, has made a huge difference but as Miguel says it's more just to do with the fact that it's another year in you know, another yeah. year in, and they've got to know him, he's got to know them. I think he's adapted a little bit. He doesn't complain so much anymore about um, aerial football and, yeah. and referees and stuff. He just gets on with it a bit more. He understands now a bit more about the English, English football and how things are played in the Premier League. I was talking to somebody about this during this week, and he's, he's also convinced himself you've got to score three goals every game to win in the Premier League because it's just so chaotic that anything can happen. Mm. You've got to actually devastate teams and destroy them in the first half hour, and that's why he's going for goals all the time. Mm. There's one player that um, certainly has um, become more influential is, is Raheem Sterling. He's got mm. seven in the Premier League. Yeah. He's one behind Harry Kane, I think. Um, is that just an example of the kind of influence that Guardiola can have on a, on a career? Posit po a positive influence? Yeah. Um, I also think as well that um, you, would, you, would, you were discussing it last week in last week's show. Um, I think there's an element that the pennies drop with, with Sterling and realise, like you've seen the players that have... That have come in. There was the talk, obviously, about um, Arsenal um, and the swap with Sanchez. Mm. And if he wants to be at Man City, then he has to do it. He had to. It was. It was a criticism of a, um, at Liverpool. He used to get into great positions at times, and the final ball wasn't always there. Are you a big fan of him at Liverpool? I think he's a great player. Yeah, he was very, very exciting. It was. You know, it was a huge loss the, when Liverpool when, when he left Liverpool at that time. Um, I think he's he's, he's going to go right to the way to the top. Yeah, OK. Let's go um, back to Wembley quickly. Um, is it going to be Spursy? The, the Spursy this afternoon? Um, <laughs> against Crystal, after, against after Crystal, Crystal, yeah, after, Real Madrid. after the Real Madrid game, what's going to happen here? Well, Pochettino's talked about this sort of Spursy thing, I think, on Friday. Has, yeah. They had a bit of, bit of uh, laugh about it. But, yeah, it would be, it would be typically Tottenham. But, no, I think, I think, I think they'll be OK today. Yeah. OK, good stuff, guys. Uh, so we've run out of time, unfortunately, on the Sunday Sub from this morning. OK, thanks very much for your time this morning. Uh, Jason, Miguel and uh, Dom, we'll see you again very soon.